we were both involved in setting up the U.S. Mexican Policy Studies Program in, 19, in 1990, I believe it was, and uh, that served as a platform for Sydney's work, my work, and a group of other colleagues, Lee Bosk's work in developing models of the potential impact of NAFTA on the Texas economy. It was a thrill to be using the U.S. Mexican Policy Studies uh, program. I should see P Peter Cleves over here. Actually, the Latin American Studies Institute was also very instrumental in, uh, in supporting us in, in these efforts. Um, Sydney's also a, an accomplished handball player. Some of, many, many of you may remember that. And uh, something you may not know is in the early 60s, Sydney wrote a thriller. I think it was the early 60s or late 50s, a thriller uh, about a news, uh, a journalist called Roscoe Barber, and it was called The Mexican Sleigh Ride, sleigh as an S-L-A-Y. I think the first scene is sitting at a table and uh, across with a woman, and all of a sudden a bullet goes through her head. So, so uh, this, is, this was set in Mexico, and so Sydney's ties to Mexico are longstanding. <clears throat> I am honored to uh, read to you a uh, note from the Mexican Secretary of the Economy, uh, Ildefonso Guajardo Villarreal. He was unable to make it here uh, to join us in this conference, but he uh, has, a, has written a letter and I would like to read it to you. Dear Dr. Ward, I'm grateful for this opportunity to recognize Professor Sidney Weintraub during this important conference organized by the LBJ School of Public Affairs, entitled NAFTA Plus 20, an assessment of the intended and unintended effects. I congratulate you for chairing this important event on the anniversary of the North American Free Trade Agreement. Professor Weintraub justly deserves the praise being, a, uh, being bestowed upon him today. His seminal work, 1984 work, Free Trade Between Mexico and the United States, was truly visionary. Published at a time when many doubted that Mexico and the U.S. would ever have such a relationship, he provided the analytical foundation for why the two economies could embrace uh, uh, in a free trade agreement. He also was the first economist to recognize that U.S.-Mexican free trade would have non-economic consequences important to the, uh, to the uh, bilateral relationship, including enhancing government and business consultation. And when NAFTA was under heated debate in the U.S., he injected calm insight and reason into the discussions. Over NAFTA's 20 years of in, in existence, Professor Weintraub has enriched the understanding of government officials, political leaders, and the public of the agreement, its economic effects, and its foreign policy implications. He's done so at a consistently high level of output through books, articles, and speaking engagements, and always showcasing his characteristic blend of academic policy and economic acumen. Congratulations to Professor Weintraub for his re recognition from the LBJ School of Public Affairs and the University of Texas. I'm honored to join him in recognizing the many and meaningful contributions you have made to improving Mexico-U.S. relations and to helping shape policies and minds in both of our countries. Sincerely, Ildefonso Guajardo Villarreal. Sydney. I Let me invite uh, Rafael Fernandez de Castro to join, join me up here and uh, say a few words about Sydney. Let me deliver this to Sydney. Hello, everybody. Uh, buenas tardes, eh, amigos y amigos de Sydney Weintraub. Uh, dear Professor Sydney Weintraub, dear Elizabeth Midley, Jeff Weintraub, Deborah Weintraub, mi paisana. Uh, Deborah was born in Mexico City when uh, Sydney was <coughs> posted, posted there as a junior American diplomat. And uh, so that's why, that's why I call her mi paisana. Uh, Dean Hutchins, uh, Dean Sherman, I'm thrilled. Close to the microphone, okay. Dean Hutchins and Dean Sherman, I'm thrilled to see Dean Sherman here. Thank you for, for being with us. I am very grateful to the organizers, Peter Ward, my friends Peter Ward, Victoria Rodriguez, and Jamie Galbright for giving me the opportunity to speak about an honor, my academic mentor and dear friend, Professor Sidney Weintraub. I see this as a celebration of Sydney's long 
and prolonged engagement with Mexico and bilateral affairs. I want to speak uh, of my understanding of Sydney's lifetime contribution to Mexican stories, U.S.-Mexican relations, and NAFTA, and to the lasting impact of ideas. But first, I would like to take this opportunity to share with you the impact that Sidney Weintraub has had on my life, and especially, I would say, on my professional life. I first met Sidney uh, in 1984, when, as a Fulbright student in the LDJ school, I enrolled in an applied research seminar, what we call it here PRP, uh, on, on US-Mexico trade relations under the direction of Professor Weintraub. I mean, this is my recollection of his class. <laughs> he truly taught us the ropes of writing a research report and was implacable when it came to being accurate with figures, tables, and quotes. This was to be only the first thing he taught me as, and that has benefited my profession. This was not the only first thing he taught me that has benefited my professional career. Another was to stretch the, capaci the, the capabilities of the student in as many ways as possible. A requisite of seeing this class was to type the final paper on a computer frame, mainframe. Yes, this was the time where personal computers were rare and there was no such thing as Microsoft Word. The computer and program was so complicated that Sydney had to hire a student from the engineering department. He was a, an Indian guy with a heavy accent and truly was very complicated <laughs> to put the entire paper into th that mainframe. Also, Sydney was and has always been a very tough editor. There was a common saying in the class, never put a sharpened pencil in Sid's hand. <laughs> he will return <laughs> our papers with a comment in every single sentence with his tiny and clear letters, all of our tests. And believe me, back in those days, we have these big sheets of papers because of the mainframe. So Sydney little letters were all over the, the, the papers. Uh, Sydney was certainly a tough professor, but he also was very generous with his time, knowledge, and experience. He had a tradition, I remember vividly well, of inviting the entire class for dinner at his home at the outset of the semester. This is how my wife Patricia and I met Gladys, Sydney's first wife. I remember her dearly, beautiful, her beautiful Spanish with a Chilean accent, a beautiful Chilean accent. Cindy soon became my mentor and he began helping me through some of the most important decisions of my professional career. I will always be in debt with you, Sidney, for all your help. I will say that Sidney was instrumental in obtaining an internship for me in the US Congress in 1985. Back then, internships were not that popular or common, much less for foreign students like myself. Sydney was the one who suggested me to go to Capitol Hill. He wrote a letter to every single Hispanic congressman recommending me as a qualified intern. He offered them my writing skills, of course, my Spanish writing skills, and that proved to be the trick. I got quite a few invitations and I spent 10 weeks in Washington working for Congressman Henry B. Gonzalez from San Antonio, the first Mexican-American who came to Washington. He, served in Wa he came to Washington uh, with John F. Kennedy in 1960. My experience in Congress propelled me to write my master's thesis in the importance of, of the U.S. Congress in the bilateral relationship. Sidney, of course, was my advisor, and he spent lo long hours editing my manuscript. Through that uh, thesis, I published my first academic article uh, 
and I'm again thankful to Sydney. When I finished my master's, Sydney guidance continued being crucial to me. I had two choices for pursuing a PhD, staying in Austin, which my wife and I loved, or go someplace else. Sydney encouraged me to get out of my comfort zone. You already know Texas, he said. Get another experience, it will enrich you. And Patricia and I, of course, we were headed for Washington, D.C. Uh, for six years, I was all but dissertation, ABD, as you say in this country. Again, Sydney mentorship was instrumental for completing my degree, which eventually made it possible for me to build an academic career. I was in the Mexican Foreign Service and Sydney kept hounding me, reminding me that I had to finish my dissertation. Thank you, Sydney, for encouraging me to finish my doctorate. Of course, Sydney sat in my doctoral committee. This is what I believe uh, Sydney uh, uh, gave to, to all us LBA students. We believe that, uh, I believe that we were very lucky here when we were students here to have uh, Sydney Weintraub as a professor, as a member of the faculty. He joined the faculty in 1976 after more than two decades in working for in the foreign service. Obviously, he was the ideal faculty member for a public policy for a public policy school, an experienced diplomat who had served mostly in Asia and Latin America. He was a true globalist in the LBA school that back then was mostly oriented inward. As a Mexican academic with experience as a policymaker, what I most admire of Sydney is that he never stopped serving his country. He retired from the Foreign Service to become a professor and a prolific writer of sound policy books. In doing that, Sidney Weintraub just chose another means, that of ideas written in precise and clear prose to serve his country, Mexico, and our world. And Sidney has been, believe me, a prolific writer. I, I, I fully agree with Chandler. I mean, he's, he's amazing. He sat on the computer and then the, test, the text is ready. According to my numbers, he was the author of 15 academic books and the editor of 19 books. He even also two novels, Mexican Sleigh Ride and the Siamese Coop Affair. These were both published shortly after he returned to the United States from Thailand in 19. 71, after being posted there for about three years. Gladys confided me that Sidney wrote the novels in order to make some money on the side. <laughs> he wanted to make sure he could afford the education of his children. Gladys and Sidney, three children, graduated from Ivy League universities. Now, uh, I need some water, hold, hold on. Now, I want to turn to Sydney's intellectual contribution and center the balance of my remarks on what I consider were Sydney's greatest contribution to the story of Mexico and the US-Mexico relations. These ideas are primarily found in the three books that he wrote on the subject, although they are found throughout his writing. The books were Free Trade Between Mexico and the, and the United States, uh, with, a, with a question mark, published in 1984, a Marriage of Convenience in 1989, and Unequal Partners in 2010. And these are, to me, the four characterizations of, of, of Sidney's. Uh, 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 and, and this is his contribution, I would say, to, 
to the field of, of, of to Mexican stories and to the field of U.S.-Mexican relations. First of all, I will put it this way, and we already heard this from Chandler, he was ahead of his time. Free Trade Between the United States and Mexico was published in 1984, as I told you, seven years before the launching of the NAFTA negotiations. Nobody was thinking that free trade would be possible for such an uneasy relationship. When the book was published in 1984, Mexico was, in fact, experiencing the peak of protectionism that very same year, all Mexican imports were being subject to import license or permits. The book's ideas seem far-fetched. A sentence in a review in Foreign Affairs is representative of how far ahead of his time this, this book was. Impossible. That is the answer most informed people will give to the question in the title. My own recollection of this seminal book was that it caused controversy and irritation in the inner circles of Mexican academia and government. Monica Berea will remember this. The book was critical of the so-called Mexican miracle, a term which make reference to the economic growth Mexico had continued to experience from three consecutive decades. Sidney wrote, and I quote, for about 40% of the economically active population of Mexico that is either on the underemployed or, um, or unemployed, there has been no Mexican miracle. Sidney also confronted the conventional wisdom of the time stating free trade was not advisable for two countries with unequal economies. Mexico, the weakest economy, would be severely damaged if it were to enter into a free trade agreement with the United States. Jeff Weintraub, ex, uh, who is also an academic, explained explain it to me this way. My father's advocacy of a free trade agreement challenged the accepted view, and so many people were skeptical or even incredulous about whether this kind of agreement will be either beneficial or feasible. The second thing, think, uh, taking advantage of interdependence. This is, this is very much seen this contribution to, to U.S.-Mexican relations. Sydney was one of the first to describe why and how Mexico and the U.S. should take advantage of, the, of their inter interdependence and interlock destinies. Instead of fighting it, in his view, the relationship need not to be problematic, it could be seen instead as an opportunity. In the introduction of a marriage of convenience, Sidney argued on the need to cooperate to take advantage of interdependence, quoting the renowned Mexican historian and intellectual Daniel Cosio Villegas, and I quote, and yet I believe that Mexico and the United States are so far from resolving their problems that in truth, it can be said that the process of understanding has not yet even begun. Indeed, the scenario in which U.S.-Mexican relations took place in the 1980s was plagued with mutual recriminations, a lack of confidence, and a high degree of, igno of ignorance regarding each other's domestic political pressures. Nevertheless, Sydney offered unequivocal evidence of, of why it was more convenient for Mexico and the U.S. to get married than to separate further. All of these differences, wrote Sidney, I quote, are complicated but do not preclude cooperation. Lack of affection has not prevented the French from working harmoniously with the Germans since World War II. And Sidney was also, as far as I know, the first to suggest the incorporation of Canada to the free trade negotiation agreement between the United States and Mexico as something that will create a formidable North American free trade zone. He wrote, I quote, although this study looks specifically at the U.S.-Mexico free trade area, nothing suggests here will preclude its expansion to North American free trade area to include Canada. What happened is now well known. Close to midnight, 
when the U.S. and Mexican officials were about to start negotiations, Canada knocked at the door. Recognizing greater possibilities and very real limits of the bilateral relationship. This is his third, I would say, accomplishment. It is through explorations and policy-oriented discussions on how Mexico and the U.S. could overcome the overwhelming obstacles preventing binational cooperation, we see an extremely well-read author who carefully studied Mexican and American intellectuals, as well as official speeches and governmental plans. This, I think, led him not only to understand the great possibilities and the very real limits of the bilateral relationship. For example, aware of the political sensitivities in Washington regarding the free movement of labor, and in Mexico City concerning direct foreign investment in the oil industry, he suggested in 1984 that, and I quote, just as free trade does not require complete freedom of foreign investment, so it does not require the free movement of labor. This idea was to prove essential to the US and, and Mexican NAFTA negotiators. As Sydney advised, NAFTA, from its inception, did never cover either migration or energy in order to avoid the creation of a political environment that would certainly have derailed the agreement. However, he also explored how the asymmetry between Mexico and the U.S., especially in their economic development, affects the interplay between the two countries and can upset bilateral deals. In Unequal Partners, he concludes, Mexico and the United States are still attached at the hip. This is deeply understood by Mexican officials, but the reality is only vaguely grasped by U.S. authorities. This is one difference in the thinking of, an, of a dependent nation compared with its domestic partner, end of the quote. Finally, what I say is the fourth most important contribution of Sydney to, to U.S.-Mexican relations. Understanding the intermestic nature of the bilateral relationship. Finally, Sydney captured, in my opinion, as no other student of U.S.-Mexican relations had before, the intermestic nature of this relationship and the aspects that this has on the relationship. That is, the main topics in bilateral affairs are actually domestic issues, immigration, arms and drug trafficking, water resources, monetary policy, among others. This feature, as Sydney explains, actually creates policy by inadvertence. He wrote, and I quote, ironically, the most important decisions of our US government vis-a-vis -vis Mexico are not those taken deliberately, but those that come out through inattention or inadvertence. Thus, for example, when the US raises interest rates, it could have an enormous impact on Mexico, but obviously, the Federal Reserve does not take Mexico into account in making this decision. In A Marriage of Convenience, Sydney developed a sophisticated recommendation to overcome policy by inadvertence. He called, he created really a concept, managed integration. Soon after A Marriage of Convenience was published, President Salinas and his team will come out with the initiative to negotiate a free trade agreement with the United States, NAFTA, which Sydney had been suggesting since the early 1980s was a sophisticated model of managed integration, as argued by Sydney as the best way to overcome the policy by inadvertence in the trade area. Recognizing a long and prolific career dedicated to the story of Mexico and the bilateral relationship, in, 19, in 2006, Mexico awarded Sydney the, its highest decoration to foreign nationals, the Aguila Azteca. Sydney is a true globalist, but I have always been intrigued about this par his particular passion for Mexico. His dedication in a marriage of convenience put it bluntly. 
and I quote, my main, my main dedication, however, is to the Mexican people. Sydney's second appointment as a diplomat in Mexico City in the visa section of the American Embassy. I believe this marked his lifetime perception. It was a perfect window to meet Mexican people from all backgrounds and socioeconomic levels. Deborah, his daughter, told me, my dad was appointed as a foreign service officer to Mexico City as his second post, and I was born there. I think his interest came from failing in love with the country from his time there as a young foreign service officer and from an intellectual and professional focus on the role of the U.S. in the development potential of our closest neighbors. I asked, no long ago, <laughs> Sydney's wife, Elizabeth Midgley, what she most admires about her husband as an intellectual. As always, she gave me a straight answer. His independence. He has always been a, a Democrat, but he, he was against most of his party for favoring trade liberalization. His views, she, she, she tells me, on immigration are those of a man independent from the right and from the left. She continues, he's incisive but careful. Sydney does not rush to judgment. And he's a believer in the power of ideas. His son, Jeff, who, uh, who I told you is an academic, he told me, my father's assumption that ideas matter reminds me of Keynes' famous remark that the ideas of economists and political philosophers both when they are right and when they are wrong, are more powerful than, that, than, e, than is commonly understood. My father's role in the long-term process leading up to the enactment of NAFTA seems to be one case that accords with the Keynes dictum. I will also point out that Sidney Weintraub is a lucky man. He has enjoyed the company of two extraordinary women, Gladys and Elizabeth. He, I just had a beautiful conversation with him Saturday, and he, we were talking about World War II, and uh, he literally explained me escape death twice. Last week, he also confessed me, and he put it this way, I am a, lo a lucky man. I never experienced poverty, and I was able to finish college before being enroll in the army. But I say, uh, personally, I do not believe it was mere luck. I do believe in the will of a person that improved his or her chances by working hard, by having temperate ambitions, by being grateful and generous, by being spiritual rather than money-oriented are by being honest and humble. What I'm trying to tell you today, uh, my mentor, my dear friend Sidney, is that you always were and continue to be a man who, created, who creates his own luck. Sidney used to be well ahead of his time, a true revolutionary thinker he was able, through his ideas, to transform and improve the perceptions of Mexico, the reality of Mexican democracy, and last but not least, the relationship between the U.S. and Mexico. Sidney saw that a more open Mexican economy and a more active engagement with international trade and investment could only lead to a more open attitude on the part of Mexican society to every aspect of public life. Liberalization of the economy and openness to the world has indeed led to the relaxation of the internal structures and the willingness to take more risks 
as for instance, in having citizens, not politicians, organize elections and count the votes. The fundamental change has led Mexico to democracy in the years following NAFTA, and this was possible in large part thanks to the path-breaking contributions in the field of ideas by a great friend of my country, Sidney Weintraub. I, I have the privilege of being very close to Sydney for the last three decades, and I will concur with Elizabeth and Jeff. Sydney is an incisive, independent thinker with the power of belief in transformational ideas. And as a scholar, I have benefited tremendously from these qualities, but also I, mo I must add from his generosity. Thank you all for your attention and for helping me honor our friend and colleague, Cindy Whitrow. Thank you very much. Sydney, Sydney, uh, Sydney, could I invite you to uh, say a few words for us? <laughs> well, thank you, Rafael. <laughs> 